What was the first ever idle animation? An iconic but often undiscussed component of computer gaming, a proper conversation about idle animations might seem quite trivial but is probably long overdue. All playable characters have various animations of course, but they haven't always practiced idleness. Great animations can help craft a character, bringing out their unique nature and personifying them as more than just movable objects. So where did idle animations all begin? Well, today's story has older origins than you might think, starting in 1979. The Tandy Radio Shack Z80 is the first subject of today's story. Marketed as the TRS-80, it was one of the earliest retail home computers, rivaling Apple II and the Commodore PET. Coming with a QWERTY keyboard stuck perpetually in upper case, 4 kilobytes of RAM and plenty of floppy drives, the TRS-80 Model 1 was not cheap and was far from perfect. Tandy Corporation's Radio Shack division had not really done computers before, they made stereos, so it was a risk. But that small home computer hit it off with small businesses and small-time hobbyists. The TRS was not host to many noteworthy titles, but it served as the sandbox for video game developer Leo Christofferson, the man who made the first ever idle animation. Christofferson was a reserve teacher from Washington State, known for his organ playing and avid programming. Leo created over 10 titles in the space of 4 years, but his standout project of the time was Android Nim. The game itself was fairly basic, but the computer community was astounded by his animation ability. So much so that some dubbed him the Walt Disney of TRS-80 graphics. Today his creation might not seem like much, but at the time it was nothing to scoff at. The screen was home to 18 robots, three of whom have the ability to zap the rest. Those three would look up and down at each other until the player took over and told them how many enemy robots they ought to shoot. Awaiting their inevitable demise at the hands of the player, the target robots look around nonchalantly, blinking and talking to one another to pass the time. His animation techniques would soon become far more sophisticated despite the limitations of the system. Leo's later work, Duel and Droids, was clear proof of this fact given the broader context of the era. As YouTuber Retro365 writes, Duel and Droids continued Christofferson's tradition of putting giant, well-animated characters on screen. The TRS-80, unlike the Apple II, had no graphics or colour capabilities and it had no way to address individual pixels. By using blocks of pixels, rudimentary low resolution black and white only images could be produced. By using rapid flickering of black and white, Christofferson was able to simulate two distinct flickery shades of grey on the CRT screen. It's difficult to say whether Christofferson's creative means of conveying both colour and motion were truly influential in the gaming industry or merely just foreshadowing of what the future would hold, but he did not go unnoticed and he proved it could be done, or rather that it had to be done for video games to really begin immersing the player. As criminally underrated YouTuber Dansan notes in his short video essay on the topic, idle animations are integral to giving characters an identity playing an essential part in keeping gamers genuinely engrossed in the wider world. They're also useful in maintaining the flow of a game, stopping characters from becoming static husks when left alone for a short while. In spite of this, however, idle animations would not really return to video games for another decade. It would be quite rare to see valuable drive space used up for trivial purposes throughout the 80s. Where Christofferson was experimenting, bigger companies were looking to capitalise, and that meant efficiency. It meant maximal fun and bold new concepts ready to catch the imaginations of prospective players. Idle animations were not at the forefront of a designer's mind. This isn't to say that developers neglected their characters or refused to give them meaningful personalities. Saving precious bytes, Nintendo was largely reliant on box art and manuals doing the legwork for them, explaining Link's backstory while simultaneously explaining his controls. Where there was space to spare though, games like Pac-Man and Duck Hunt gave players some animated insight into their characters. Nor did developers neglect this idea of maintaining flow through animation. The wind blowing in Super Mario Bros. 2 and the very vibrant colours of Super Mario Bros. 3 always made the world feel very much alive. Even on Game Boy, Super Mario Land's glowing candles and moving seas provide stark contrast to its more static NES predecessor. But in the early 1990s, everything changed. The fourth generation of consoles laid claim to 16-bit technology, giving animators and graphic designers much more room to work with. As the whites of characters' eyes widened and the backdrops became more elaborate, the mere doubling of bits made the third generation look almost stale in comparison. The keen leader in this race was initially Sega's Mega Drive, or Genesis, in the States. And leading the way across the pond was a certain blue blur with big red shoes. In June of 1991, 
Sonic the Hedgehog debuted and made Mega Drive designs really shine. We did a black game I'll there. take Sonic and Genesis. <laughs> I knew that. Sonic the Hedgehog. More action, more speed. Sega Genesis, it's a whole lot more for less. Where there had been graphical struggles from Sega years prior, particularly in notable former flagship titles like Alex Kidd, the design of Sonic's wide world provided a breath of fresh air miles and miles away from the MS-DOS vibe that the Genesis seemed to initially emulate. While running around at the speed of sound, Sonic innovated in nearly every sense. One thing we'll never forget, though, is Nintendo's response, waging a war of the mascots with Mario at the helm. How did Sonic become such an iconic video game character in such a short space of time? Despite Mario's decade-long head start, Sonic had something Mario had not yet received, an idle animation. This was alongside many other animations too, of course. Where Mario had a mustache, Sonic had a smirk. With an incredibly expressive range, his cocky attitude required no words to be conveyed. But it was Sonic's idle animation which nestled in the minds of gamers forever. Put down your controller for a short break, and his foot will start tapping. I mean, looking back, there really wasn't much to it. A grand total of three sprites were all Sega needed to convey Sonic's impatience. But combined with his balancing act, and a more pushy animation seen early doors in Marble Zone, it gave him a bright personality, one effectively realized both in-game and in marketing. Why can't it be more like that nice boy Mario? Oh, yeah! brand Those three frames were all it took for Genesis games to accelerate the trend. Soon enough, nearly every platforming game would endeavor to tuck away some easy little idle Easter eggs. Sometimes just for fun, but usually to the benefit of their character's personality. Other developers outside the Sega bubble were quick to catch on, however, Working on DOS, and also designing an eccentric protagonist, id Software gave their young icon Commander Keen quite a few idle animations, the most infamous of these being his retrospectively questionable mooning of the player. The undisputed king of 2D idle animations would indeed be crowned in 1994 with the release of Earthworm Jim. The titular worm had plenty to keep himself occupied with, juggling his zapper, using his own body as a skipping rope, and even unintentionally showing his pants off, there was little Jim wasn't content to do. Seeking to dethrone Jim a year later, Rayman's debut on the Atari Jaguar sought to surprise players with a fourth wall break, put the game down for so much as a second, and the limbless protagonist will loudly announce his presence. In later games, Sonic would start tapping his wrist and even lying down for a bit if the player waited around long enough. Give him three minutes on Sonic CD, and he'll just end the game for you. He was always eager to get going. The fifth generation of consoles, though, would stop him dead in his tracks. Having so far only given Yoshi a pensive chin scratch in his Game Boy Advance title, Nintendo themselves hadn't experimented much with giving their beloved characters idle animations. That would change massively a year later though, when Super Mario 64 hit the shelves in 1996. Hello. In a trend that Sega had kick-started, the 3D future was being chased by developers for the Sega Saturn. Nintendo rode the fifth generation late after an infamous falling out with Sony, which led to the release of PlayStation, releasing their 64-bit response nearly a year and a half after the Saturn came out. Wow! Nintendo could afford to take their time, though. Sega was struggling massively with the development of Sonic Extreme, and without a Sonic title, the Saturn wasn't faring at all well in the West. Meanwhile, Nintendo shipped the Nintendo 64 alongside their killer application, Super Mario 64. It blew Sonic out of the water completely. Soon the N64 had restored the iconicity of Mario and put him centre stage of the gaming world once again. They also shipped Mario with some very complicated idle animations. In Mario's case, it certainly takes a while for anything to kick in, but whenever he isn't in danger, he'll eventually start catching some Zs. Mario sought to start a new trend, changing his idle animations to reflect his environment. Whether this was displaying his low health, his intolerance of noxious gases, or just his discomfort in the cold. The plumber certainly has rivals, though. At the time, the titular protagonist from Conker's Bad Fur Day certainly gave him a run for his coins. Conker found many ways to keep himself entertained. And Mario's former nemesis, Donkey Kong, also had his fair share of tricks up his sleeve. Regardless of Mario's impact, however, this sort of seemed like the natural progression for 3D characters. With more angles to see them from than ever before, no character could ever remain completely still like they once did in two dimensions. As the world around them became ever more detailed, a good idle animation for a character became ever more essential to the preservation of a game's flow. Even something basic, like the protagonist's breathing patterns, had to be well thought out. Otherwise, the world around them would look incredibly stiff. 
To demonstrate a clear failure in this department, Bubsy 3D provides a real deviation from the usual idling cycles of the time. Bubsy himself is one stiff plank anyway, a janky character fitting a janky backdrop. But once you leave the game long enough, he doesn't go and take a nap or start juggling. He does something very interesting, and he starts playing with your TV settings. This is a mildly funny fourth wall break, but when we kind of dig into it, it's quite lazy. Playing a pre-rendered, flat animation, and deciding to take Bubsy straight out of the 3D world he otherwise lives in, serves very little in the way of immersion. It just kind of makes him more of a gimmicky mess. He's f***ing with my TV. Good. In dynamic worlds full of motion and intrigue, idle animations might seem irrelevant, but they can really help elevate a game. While they're now standard for platformers everywhere, it's pretty cool to think that one guy working on some blocky androids essentially predicted the future of game design. Whenever you see an idle animation, think back to the late Leo Christofferson and his quaint little robots. You can even play through his 2012 remake if you'd like. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this little journey through time, and I hope to see you again soon.